Okay, we will start. So, hello everybody, thank you for coming. So, today we have the pleasure of uh, hearing Wouter Mostert. So, Wouter is from Oxford University. Um, he's originally for, from South Africa, he was born in South Africa, so of course he's following the rugby. Um, I hope you will not hold him, uh, get, hold it against him, right? Uh, but um, yes, rugby is important. In Australia too, so then Wouter moved to Australia and did his PhD in Australia, and then went and did uh, several postdocs in um, in the US, uh, and I met him at the time when he was doing a postdoc with Luke Dyker in Princeton, and we worked together on breaking waves. And then he got a position at Santa Barbara. Unfortunately, that got cancelled because of COVID. So he was a COVID victim, didn't get his position because they cancelled it. And luckily now he's in Oxford University, so that's nice for us because that's closer than, uh, than Santa Barbara. <laughs> Off you go, Wuta. You will talk about splashing of colliding liquid cylinders. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stefan, and thank you, um, thank you for uh, to everyone for for welcoming me here today. It's a it's a great uh, pleasure. It's a it's a real privilege to be able to give this talk to you today. Um, uh, indeed, uh, being in the UK, it is you know, there are many many hard things about the the recent history of the UK and Europe, but. Uh, one thing that is still nice is that it is close, so um, it was it was great to take the train over instead of an incredibly long flight. So that was that was really nice. So it's a real pleasure for me to talk about uh, this work on splashing of colliding liquid cylinders. Um, really, this this talk is is due to um, uh, my collaborators and students. With special thanks to my current PhD student Kai Tao Tang, who uh, produced most of the results I'll be presenting today. Um, but um, uh, David Champlin is a student who was a student, actually an undergraduate student at the Missouri University of Science and Technology, uh, helped uh, formulate uh, some parts of the problem, um, as well as um, uh, Kaito's co-supervisor co Thomas Adcock, and of course um, uh, uh, thanking uh, uh, Luke and Stefan for um, uh, the working together with them on the, the breaking wave data, which I will produ uh, share some of in the introductory slides as well as Martin Erinen, who graciously um, uh, gave me a, a video to show some experimental breaking waves, because as it turns out, not everything can be done numerically. More's the pity, but uh, so it is. So, um, so the motivation for this work really revolves around breaking waves, and breaking waves are important for a variety of reasons. Uh, the ocean and the atmosphere, they communicate through a variety of means. They communicate through the interface between the between them, and that, that's the ocean surface, of course, and as we know, there are lots of waves on the ocean surface, and they break, and as they break, they, they mediate a lot of the flux and the communication between the uh, ocean and the atmosphere. So some example of fluxes are highlighted here. This is from a paper by Cavallari in 2018. Um, we have momentum fluxes, mass fluxes, and energy fluxes, um, and, uh, it's, and breaking waves play a rather crucial role in many of these processes. Um, it's a difficult problem because the mechanisms are coupled in general, so you, it's, it's difficult to abstract out any one part of uh, the physical mechanism to try to understand the others because they're so closely coupled. And the other thing that makes it hard is it's a very multi-scale process. So as we know, the, the, the Earth is huge, um, but breaking waves um, are on the order of a meter or less or more, depending on, on, on you know, what, what, what kind of wave you're looking at. Um, and the, the key point here is that what happens at the small scale modulates what happens at the large scale. And so that, that is a multi-scale process and it tends to be quite difficult to try to understand the whole process at once. Um, so we, we tend to focus on one part of it, um, but that's hard because of, of, of this very nature of multi-scale processes. So um, one of these fluxes that I, that I discussed was, of course, mass flux. And spray production by waves is, a, is um, uh, one, of the, one of the questions that we have to address when talking about mass flux. So oceans, they produce significant sea spray aerosol. And I'm going to focus especially on large spray, but I'm going to briefly talk about uh, each of the different kinds. Um, large spray is a major source of atmospheric drag in high wind conditions. And this plays a role in how our hurricane models work, for example, because 
Um, as it turns out, we have a, a lot of difficulty estimating what the drag coefficients of the ocean surface uh, should be in high wind co conditions. And there's been some, uh, some uh, very interesting work by a number of, a number of people. I'm, I'm citing here uh, sort of informally a few contributors. I'm sorry, that, that's a title that should be Sroka and Emmanuel from MIT, I think. And, um, and they've made some recent progress that actually simplifies understanding how um, drag coefficients work in high wind conditions, um, but it still remains to try to understand how mass flux works and how, um, how ocean waves produce droplets of different sizes. Um, as it, it tends to depend not just on the wind, but also on the sea state, and those two things are not, it's not, um, if you know one, you don't automatically know the other. Um, and so it, is, it still remains a, a, a difficult question. Um, but the key, the, sort of the key question underpinning everything is how do size distributions of droplets of spray arise from wave breaking? So on the left here I've got a diagram. This is from a, a fairly old by now a study by Andreas in 1995 showing the different kinds of spray that you can get. So generally when waves break, um, when they break they ingest a lot of bubbles. We haven't talked about bubbles and we won't really, but a lot of these bubbles they get in, in, entrained into the um, into the subsurface and they rise back up to the surface again and they burst. And when they burst, they can produce really small fragments, film droplets, or they can produce somewhat larger uh, droplets uh, called jet droplets. Um, that's one of the major uh, production mechanisms for especially smaller sea spray aerosol. Um, and then high wind uh, can rip droplets off the crests of waves and we call this spume. And then of course this very familiar mechanism of splashing drops. So when a wave breaks, it splashes. Right. And, um, and across all mechanisms, uh, this here is a review. Again, this is now starting to age a little bit. There, there are more recent um, uh, uh, what are called sea spray generation functions in the literature, but this sort of gives a good picture of, of what's out there. This is a uh, review by Fabrice Veron in 2015, um, showing as you go to smaller droplets, you have a number of models that agree reasonably well on sea spray generation functions. So these are estimates for how much a given uh, sea state in a given wind condition might produce droplets of a given size. Uh, but then as we get to the bigger droplets, there's less agreement between, um, between different models. Um, so just talking in a little bit more detail about what each of these mechanisms are. Uh, so remember I mentioned film droplets. These arise from bubbles rising to the surface and then bursting. Um, these you can these are some lovely visualizations from Villamo's group, um, of course showing showing this lovely uh, uh, sheet retraction and there's a centrifugal instability, and it, we've got these lovely small droplets being produced. Um, this is a, a great example of, of film droplets. These account for the smallest of the. It's quite a large range of droplets, but still the smallest of the of the spray. Um, and then, of course, larger uh, droplet size, you get these jet droplets. I cite here work by Luc Dijker, but um, I want to really acknowledge the extensive work produced by Alexi Berni um, uh, during his time here. And these account for somewhat larger uh, spray droplets in the, in the whole sphere of, of spray production. Um, and then we come to spray. Uh, spume. So spume is the one the where we've got the wind ripping the droplets off from the crests of the waves. Um, and there's been some uh, really interesting work in recent years, especially coming out of this uh, the Troitskaya et al. group. This is from a scientific reports uh, paper coming from that group. And they have found that they ran these experiments and they found that the dominant mechanism of spray production was not these projections where you've got these ligaments that form and then droplets that pinch off from the end of them, but instead these instances of bag breakup. So bag breakup, this is on the surface of the wave near the crest. Uh, we get these projections coming up, but they tend to inflate into bags, especially this is a great example here. They inflate into bags and then the bag films rupture. And we actually get a, it's, it, it resembles a film droplet rupture, but the physics are a bit different. Um, we end up with this, um, with, with a very, Quite, quite beautiful um, uh, fragmentation process going on here. And these account for among the, the largest droplets. That's spume. Spray, of course, is also a contributor. And we don't really, well, when I say spray, I mean splashing drops. We don't really know an awful lot about splashing drops. Uh, Fabrice Verone um, uh, said that he, he wasn't really sure that they would be a very major contributor to, to large spray, but the data is very limited. 
Um, but then there was a number of, of studies that came out recently. One experimental, which I, I really want to focus on, but also these numerical studies. Um, There's a numerical study from Fred Stern's group in 2016. There's the work that, um, that I did with Stefan and, and Luke. Um, that's, uh, here's a, a, a snapshot from that showing a breaking wave. And there's a, these experiments from Martin Erinen of the University of Maryland. And um, the great thing about these studies is that they were able to uh, produce statistics or um, at, at least size distributions and in some cases velocity distributions um, for the droplets produced by splashing. And these are droplets that are separate from spume because there, were, there was no wind in the, in the simulations or experiments that were performed. So that's uh, the data from that applies really to the very largest of the, of the droplet sizes here in these uh, that are of interest in the uh, sea spray generation functions. And again, I mentioned this before, but notice that existing sea spray generation functions do not really agree on production rates for these most, for these largest of droplets. So this seems like an interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, topic to investigate. Oh, to show you this video, this is uh, Martin Aronin's, uh, um, uh, from his experiments. This is a visualization from a side of, of a plunging breaker. You see the breaker coming in here. And then you can see this, this uh, spray being generated by splashing, right? And you can see there's multiple sources, right? There was that initial sort of wall of droplets that we saw, as well as various other, um, uh, other sort of secondary splashing events. Um, and then Martin also saw later on in the, in the uh, breaking process, you started to see big bubbles rising to the surface and bursting. So we started getting those film and jet droplets. You can actually see a lot of these bubbles rising to the surface here. It's really beautiful work. You can see some of them bursting too. I'm not sure if the contrast allows you to get the full experience from the from the movie, but it's a it is a um, I believe it's supplementary material also associated with uh, JFM that that group pu uh, published. Uh, here is a numerical visual visualization. This is um, showing similarly from numerics how you can get large spray droplets. This is from um, our work in the JFM. Um, la that was published last year. And the real thing that I want to emphasize here is, again, very conveniently stops at a moment when there's a big production of uh, these spray droplets nearby. Um, you see uh, many, many examples of these waves producing, um, uh, producing lots of spray through splashing. Now, I want to draw your attention to one thing in the video here. And I, if I can, there. I'm going to stop it here. You will see that one of the events corresponds with the production of this sort of wall of droplets. You noticed it as well in Martin Aronin's work. There was this wall of droplets. You get this vertical sheet that's formed. And a lot of these little droplets that are formed, actually quite, I should say, large droplets that are formed um, as a result of the impact. Um, so I'll just, there you can, you can see them really flying up into the air and then coming back down. I'll play it for you one more time. It's a very well-defined event. And then, of course, you also get the, the splashing produced by the other, by the ongoing breaking process in general, like that big one at the end. So this wall of droplets, this actually accounts for a large part of the statistics that, that we're seeing. Here's a, here's a still from Martin's work. And this is, this is sort of looking uh, just from the back of the wave. At, um, so uh, this chunk here corresponds to numerically this chunk here. And you can see there's this, there's this re, it's a, clearly it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a sheet of droplets. And we see qualitatively at least the same kind of um, sheet of droplets being produced there. And so these do account for a large uh, proportion of the detected splash droplets. Um, but it's, it's not really clear why it's there. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that this experiment uh, was formed by, it's a dispersively focused wave, right? So it's a wave group that is made to focus at some point in the wave flume, and then the wave components all come together, and then your wave breaks and it, and it splashes. This wave here is not. This is, a, this is a periodic Stokes wave, which has too high a slope and then eventually breaks because it is unstable. The point that I'm making is the sources, the way that these two waves were generated was different, but the local dynamics with respect to the production of this wall of droplets seems to be the same. Um, and, the, and we might say the same about uh, one et al's study as well, which I also cited on the previous slide. Um, so it does look like this is not this does not appear to be something that you've got to really tune the wave to get, although it is more common with plunging breakers than with spilling breakers. Spilling breakers are weaker breakers. 
Um, but it does, it does seem to reflect a more, I don't want to say universal, but maybe a large class of breakers may feature this, uh, this, this wall of droplets. So I was quite curious about this, about this wall of droplets and, and wondering what could be an idealized mechanism to describe how these droplets are formed. So there's a schematic at the top there. What we think is happening is that we've got the initial, the initial overturning of the wave here, and then we've got this sort of uh, projection coming up from that, from that impact, this splash up, right? And then this uh, bulk here collides with the rest of the bulk of the wave, and then there's a sort of collision here which uh, seems to produce uh, this wall of droplets. Martin Erinen calls it a closing of an indentation in his paper. Um, and that, that, that seems to be a good description for it. So, well, there was also this work, and this is not breaking waves, this is a totally different context, um, but this is the work coming out of Villamo's group, again, this is from Batiste Nail, um, and they, they did this experiment where they had a flat plate and they fired a jet of water down at it, and it produced this flat, this savar sheet that propagates outwards, right? So it's this sheet here, you can just sort of see the surface of it here. It's the edge of the sheet that you see there. And then there's a series of visualizations here. And so in the middle here, you can't really see it. It's not, it's not uh, coming through in the contrast very well, but the sheet is in the middle of the, of, the, um, of the image. And the water in the sheet is advecting outwards to the right. And then these two sparks are produced at two neighboring points in the sheet, right? And so this ruptures the film at those two points and produces these holes. The holes look like this. So when you look down from above, there's one hole, there's the other. That's where the two sparks uh, va vaporize some water and produce these holes. And then these holes advect outwards along with the rest of the sheet. And as they do so, the rims at the edges of the holes retract so the holes grow. Right? So at a later time, the holes grow. And eventually, as you can see here, these are the holes growing. This is looking from the side the rims of the holes collide. And when they collide, they produce the sheet that goes vertically. And then you will notice that there are these perturbations along the top of the, at, at top, along the, top of the sheet um, of, in the plane of collision. So the hypothesis that I, that I put before you is that this mechanism resembles this whole collision mechanism. So uh, what this schematic, this is from Neil's paper, this is the schematic of the two rims coming together and then producing this vertical sheet. And then there's a wavelength of perturbation on there, which may or may not be unstable. Right. Um, so that's the hypothesis. And so we're going to see, is there a way that we can model this process and can we connect it to breaking waves? Now, the most obvious thing to do is just to compare the statistics from Nail's paper with that of, Mar of Martin Erlen. And the picture is not, not very encouraging at first sight because in the, in the Savar sheet problem, they fit a gamma distribution, because Villermo really loves gamma uh, distributions. Um, and we see here, this, um, th these are the experimental points that they've got. So this was for, a, I think the Weber number of collision here was something like 198. And they see, they see data that fits really well on the right tail um, of the distribution. They don't really have very much in the left tail, but it does seem to suggest the gamma distribution. Whereas if you look at Martin Erinen's data, and this is a figure from his paper where um, he also cites uh, some of the numerical data, including, I should have cited earlier, this, there's this um, numerical study as well from Ramirez uh, uh, de la Torre, actually 2022 from Atle Jensen's group. Um, if you look at these distributions, uh, both from Martin's experimental data and from the various numerical uh, uh, distributions, they don't match, right? So on the, on, the, on the right here, we've got what looks like these are log-log axes, right? So we look like what's a power law on the left tail, perhaps another power law or some kind of fall off on the right. We don't really know what's going on there, but it certainly looks like a power law on the left. And here, this is a gamma distribution, right? So they're not the same thing. But, but I mean, this is also not two planar rims colliding. These are two holes that are the rims of holes that are colliding. So there could be a curvature effect um, in the in the rims, and also the the, um, the dimensionless groups aren't matched. So that could also be a reason for why they don't why they don't compare very well. So uh, let's see if we can do something a little bit better. So now I come to the problem that uh, that, that we're we're trying to solve. So we're using uh, the basilisk package. This is a, a, um, so it's, it's a, a variety of solvers in it, but we're going to use the two-phase Navier-Stokes uh, solver, including surface tension. And we're going to initialize these two um, 
these two cylinders in periodic boundary conditions, so the cylinders are effectively infinite, we're going to impart a velocity onto the two cylinders and give them a viscosity and surface tension. And so this defines a number of dimensionless groups. We've got the Weber number, which describes qualitatively essentially the violence of the impact. So it's inertial effects divided by surface tension effects. So if your Weber number is large, you expect your surface tension effects to be on quite a small scale relative to the uh, scale of the inertial effects. We have, and I'm sorry to use here an Ornazorga number instead of a Laplace number, um, but it would do my head in if I tried to do the reciprocal in my head every time. Generally, low Ornazorga numbers correspond with uh, small viscous effects relative to surface tension effects. So here, this is a fairly small uh, viscous contribution um, that we're presenting. I'm not really going to be showing much um, investigation into the, uh, the behavior of Orner's organ number. It's really going to be focused on Weber number as well as Nmax parameter, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we have a density ratio and a viscosity ratio, which are set to match water and air. Um, and then what we do with these cylinders is we perturb them. We perturb them with a white noise spectrum. Um, and uh, this, this follows actually a recent study by Paul et al. and Stefan Zaleski's group, um, uh, uh, where, we're, where we're using a broad banded spectrum really to per perturb these cylinders. And so the standard deviation of the, of the perturbation is, is, um, is set by this epsilon zero uh, variable, and then we non-dimensionalize it with respect, to, with respect to the initial diameter of the cylinder. And then the cut-off wavelength, we, we don't do a white noise out to infinite wave numbers. We, we cut it off at some maximum value, and this is that cutoff. Right? So a small value of nmax means that the smaller maximum wavelength is, is represented in the data. Um, and then this, this is just a representation of the spectrum of the perturbation to, to show that we're sort of getting a white noise. Um, it's really, it's a truncated white noise spectrum. Okay, and so here's a picture of the, or a video I should say, of the simulation of the result that you get, right? So this is at a Weber number of 200, so quite a violent impact, at a cutoff wave number of 60. And this is looking from the side, and as you can see, when the two cylinders collide, they produce these ligaments, and the ligaments produce these little droplets. And then if you, if you notice, you'll notice that there are, if you look, sorry, you'll see that there are some ligaments that appear to merge after some time. You can see that even now there are something like, what, seven or eight ligaments there. But if we go right back to the beginning of the, of the, of the video, there were many more, right? So that you will notice that these ligaments actually merge over time. And then, of course, as they merge, they tend to produce bigger droplets, but fewer bigger droplets. Let's go on. If this will let me. There we go. Okay, so let's study this. We're going to take a slice, just a slice anywhere through the through the, the plane of the collision, and we're just going to look, before we worry about the ligaments and the droplets, we're going to look at the sheet that's projected up vertically. Um, so this is such a slice. We've got the two cylinders that have come in and they collide mutually and we see this, this sheet coming up here. And then as time advances, the sheet uh, advects upwards. We're interested in seeing what is the velocity profile along that sheet. And actually it turns out to be, you, if you assume that the flow is uh, inviscid, so there's no viscous effects, um, you actually get a, a quite a simple hyperbolic equation just from its conservation of mass conservation of momentum that gives you this um, uh, uh, this profile. It suggests a self-similar uh, uh, profile for the velocity um, in, in the sheet. And when you actually plot this, when you plot mu y times t divided by y, right, that should be a constant. But then we actually see that over, over different locations in the sheet and at different times, because that is a parameter in the, in, in the self-similarity, we see roughly constant behavior. So that gives us a description for the profile of the velocity in the sheet. So far, so good. Feel free to interrupt at any time for questions, by the way. Um, the sheet itself, uh, not just the velocity, but also the profile of the sheet follows a self-similar evolution. Um, and you can do some analysis. I won't bore you with the details, but you get something like this. By the way, um, something very similar was done by Wang and Buriba in 2017. In fact, it's their lead that we kind of followed. Um, it's just that in their case, they've got a radially expanded sheet. We have a planar collision. So there are some details that are different 
um, but, but we, we, we get qualitatively the same kind of result, this uh, self-similarity. And it turns out that when you apply this scaling, um, and I will show you at early time on the left there, that we get this purple sheet, and then at later time, um, when we scale it accordingly, we see a collapse of all the, of all the, uh, of all the different profiles. So this does indeed suggest that this is the kind of um, self-similarity we see. Notice, of course, that the profile deviates at, at the point where we, where we get the rim formation. We'll talk more about the rim now, I think. Rim. Rim position. So by the rim, I mean this, uh, this bulge at the top of the sheet. So this is the bulge from which the ligaments emerge, right? Um, so the rim position and thickness roughly grows as the square root of time. Uh, this, the, uh, this, we don't have a theoretical, I'll come up front, we don't have a theoretical justification for this, but it does seem to work really well. The position of the rim scales as the square root of time, and it has a dependency on the Weber number, and so does the thickness of the rim, B rim, it seems to uh, scale with the square root of time. And when you, uh, when you plot, for example, the position of the rim, that is uh, uh, on log, log axes, uh, you do see this square root uh, dependency here that looks roughly similar for uh, problems of different Weber number um, and, and in fact different uh, perturbation amplitude. So we tested a number of these things. We also tested a number of different uh, cutoff wave numbers, but of course that doesn't matter quite so much for the, the question of rim evolution. That's a ligament question. And then we see a fairly good collapse um, of the data. It's not perfect. We're not 100% certain on these scalings, but it does seem to match the data very well. So we've talked about the sheet, we've talked about the rim. Let's talk about the ligaments, the most exciting part. So the ligaments, I've got a little schematic diagram, it's not really a schematic, we've got a diagram at the top there, and maybe the arrows are, yeah, the arrows are around right. The Y uh, describes the uh, you know, is the, your, obviously it's your vertical, vertical position measurement. Uy is the velocity of <coughs> fragments produced by the, uh, by the fragmentation process in the ligament. And h lig is the height of each ligament. So if you look at the uh, ligament length and you plot for a number of different values, looking at different individual ligaments plotted over time, and you look at their lengths, uh, we, uh, we see a um, a scaling that goes linear with time. This is again something a little bit, a little bit semi-empirical. We had a reference, we had a reference, um, uh, a scaling that we tested here. This is this big dashed line. This is from a study by Lai et al. Um, from Princeton in 2018, where they where they looked at really jet drop formation from bubble bursting, um, and you know, it's a you can't really claim one over the other. Uh, but certainly the mechanism proposed by Lyotard would be different from what we're talking about here. The, the, the fact is that our ligaments are being produced by, apparently, this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a fairly difficult question to really ascertain the details of. Uh, the, when we've got our perturbed cylinders, there are, and there's, there's a plane of collision, there are these points of locally high curvature, sort of cavities that are caused to uh, very quickly collapse due to the, just the inertial um, uh, uh, convergence, really, of the two cylinders. And this, this leads to a kind of behavior which is not really, well, not really well defined. There's not a clear methodology for investigating how they grow. Certainly, a linear stability analysis does not apply because, since we're using a white noise spectrum, um, the slope of each perturbation is, in general, not going to be small. And it seems to be the highest wave number perturbations where the slope is going to be the greatest, um, where we see the ligaments uh, growing. So um, attributing this to a particular instability, attributing the ligament growth to a particular instability does not seem to be um, a fruitful approach, especially if we're taking a linear stability analysis. Um, so that's the, it, it, we need a different approach, and it, we're not really sure how to um, how to ascertain the details of that. But it does appear that we could scale it linearly with time. Um, uh, perhaps you, yeah, linearly with time seems to be the, the the best alternative to the to the scaling produced by Lie et al. Um, and then, of course, we can also look at the velocity profile within the ligament. This is interesting. Remember that I discussed the sheets a moment ago, and we had that self-similar profile within the sheet. If we now take a slice, and we, we take a slice through the, I just wish I had a pointer long enough. If we 
took it, oh, I've got my mouse. You take a profile vertically from the point of collision down at the bottom of the sheet and you trace it all the way up through a ligament and you plot that, that velocity profile, you get something that looks like this. Right? So this is uh, y over the square root of uh, Weber number of time. So let's say you fix time and you take a small y position, right? So at some time during the collision process, small y corresponds to here, right? So close to the point of collision, uh, you are within the bulk, you're not yet in a ligament, uh, your profile appears self-similar, right? At some point, as you follow a profile up, you see a drop, you see this wobble, and then you see a drop. And then if you trace what happens after that, all of the profiles, no matter which one you take, they all seem to go back onto the self-similar scaling, but at an offset. So what is the reason for this offset? Wang and Bariba saw something similar, um, as, did, uh, as did especially, I think, uh, Geckley and Gordillo's uh, study. They saw this similar offset. It is not clear exactly what the reason is, but I'm just going to go back a few slides. could have something to do with this diagram here. So if you look here, what this would amount to is um, you're tracing up from the bottom and you go up through here and there's this little red zone here. What is being plotted here is the local dissipation rate. So it is possible that as you traverse, as you take the profile up and you traverse that little red zone there, uh, that accounts for the drop. Now it's curious that it's always the same drop for all of the, all of the ligaments. As if we go back to the slide here, it always seems to be the same offset. Here. As, we, as you go along the profile, you see the drop. It's always the same drop, no matter where you go, even for different simulations altogether. So uh, that's interesting. It's, uh, again, something that we think we qualitatively understand, um, but estimating the, the, the volume of the, uh, the, the value of the drop is not clear. There was a recent analysis of droplet impact um, by Alfonso Costrohan's Peter group at, um, at University of Oxford, and they used an approach where they tried to estimate uh, basically a, a, a drop in, in, um, in what they were expect in a velocity profile that they had retrieved. Um, but again, they were, it, was, it was sort of a similar outcome to here. They saw a qualitative result and they were not able to fully account for the quantitative, uh, quantitatively for the drop in the, in, in, in the profile that they saw for their problem. It's a different problem from this. But I'm just remarking, it's something that we've, we've uh, identified. Yes? If you, if you, uh, you say it's, it may be linked to dissipation, but yes. then you would expect that it depends on the Weber number. Yes. And it doesn't, it doesn't. seem to, right? Yeah, so. Is that, is that a sign that maybe it's not dissipation? It might not be dissipation. One thing that it could, well, we haven't che uh, checked Onazorga dependence, and it could have something to do with that. But um, it is true that Weber number, you would expect to see an uh, uh, effect for that. Yes. Uh, since the fans ask questions, I. There is a very strong analogy also with splashing. If you make one of the cylinders to the diameter, it's 2D splashing. Oh, yeah, that's true. At the base of the splashing, yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. We should take a look into that. I was just wondering yesterday, because actually that's a, that's a great point. Because if we even look at the schematic for the, for the breaking wave here, if I can... Yeah, here we go. These two rims are not of the same diameter, so it makes sense to have as a parameter in your param in your anal analysis the ratio of the diameters. We have not done that here. Another thing is if you take a symmetry axis between the two planes, yes, it's uh, in this in, uh, splashing on a, on a on a plane on a yes. plane. So um, and, and that sometimes it gives two jets going like this, like a Y. Oh yes, that's yeah, that's true. We don't observe that here. Do you know what the Weber numbers are where you see that kind of? Um, quite high with liquid metals. Okay. I wonder what would happen. Maybe, maybe we need to go to higher. Well, grid convergence is a, is a question that we would, we would need to consider at very high Weber numbers, of course. But uh, that could be, certainly be worth considering. Do we have any further, now that we have an opportunity, any more questions? No? All right. Okay, um, so it's not clear why there's a drop, but it does seem consistent with where, um, or, or independent of Weber number. Um, so let's talk about this merging behavior. So here are two, these are not videos, sadly, just snapshots, but you can see that at different times you might get different numbers of ligaments. Really, that's how we can tell that they merge. 
Um, and um, it's similar to what has been observed by Wang and Bariba uh, for, for their radial rim expansion problem. For example, they also see the two neighboring ligaments may merge. Um, and uh, if what, what, what we've got plotted here is just an interface profile extracted from the simu simulation directly. If you look at uh, consecutive time steps, you can see that we have ligaments that continue to emit droplets, oh, continue to emit droplets, but even while they do that, they are merging. And so Wang and Reba are sort of um, very, uh, you know, actually quite logically, suggested that this is because there's an underlying um, uh, heterogeneity in the profile of the rim, and so this induces a um, sort of a, a slope, some characteristic slope to the rim, and so by mass conservation it implies that there is, since there is liquid going into a ligament, since there's a slope, it must also impart a tangential component to the, to the ligament, right? So the ligaments are of course gonna drift along because there's an underlying slope to the, to the profile. In our case, we don't have a radial profile, but we do have a broadband perturbation spectrum, so it would make sense that there is, and you can in fact just see, just by looking at it, that there is an underlying characteristic slope of some kind. Um, and this, this induces a drift velocity, which depends on uh, the difference between the velocity of the fluid entering the rim and the speed of the rim itself. So that's what these two variables here, here are. So, there is a, a, a sort of a, uh, a somewhat intuitive argument for estimating what this drift velocity might be and how we can get an, how we can use it to get an estimate for the number of ligaments at any given time. Right? So ligament drift velocity. This is just what was in the previous slide. Um, theta is some characteristic slope. Um, I showed you earlier the rim and the sheet dynamics, right, or kinematics at least. So we know what we know how to estimate this quantity here, right? So we've got that from points one and two above. That was the sheet and the rim characteristic. Now, if we say there's a characteristic instantaneous rim corrugation of epsilon rim, this is not necessarily going to be the initial condition because, of course, it will change as the simulation progresses. Um, and if we write the number density per length of cylinder of ligaments by n lig, uh, then we can hypothesize that um, the, the characteristic rim corrugation is proportional to the radius of the rim. This turns out to be about right. I don't have data to show this, but um, Kaitao ex extracted data um, uh, estimating the, 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 the uh, characteristic um, uh, corrugation, and you saw that, that it stayed, if when you divide it by B rim, you get an approximately the same, uh, a constant value. And, and this is probably the most intuitive jump, that sine of theta by the small angle approximation, your theta is going to be proportional to that corrugation amplitude times by n lig. So n lig uh, kind of acts like a wave number in, in that sense, and so this looks like a slope which looks like tan theta, which at small theta looks like sine theta, right? So um, uh, the, the selection, probably it will be epsilon rim times some, um, some proportion of n lig, um, but estimating that would require a, a fairly, I think a fairly extensive statistical analysis to, to really nail it down. But this is the intuitive argument so far. So when you plug everything, you ultimately, I won't show you the, the individual steps, but you ultimately obtain something like this. So one on n lig squared goes uh, proportional, I think this is a typo in e to the 2 five, but proportional to time, um, plus a proportionality, uh, sorry, an indirect proportionality constant. And so when you plot this, um, uh, for different Weber numbers, you see something that kind of collapses, um, but the point is that you do see this uh, one over uh, time behavior for one over time squared, actually for n lig. Um, which suggests that for sufficiently large times, your B, the effect of B goes goes away. It's not form uh, we haven't formally justified that, but but it it does appear like a, a reasonable sort of shape to the uh, to the data. Now, if we look at the fragment statistics themselves, right? We've discussed the we've discussed the sheet, we've discussed the rim, we've discussed the ligaments, how they grow and how they merge. Let's talk about the fragments that they produce. Um, so the first question is just how big are the fragments, right? Um, and can we track how big a fragment is relative to the diameter of the ligament that produced it? And so um, this was, I should have cited, sorry, I should have cited here Wang and Bariba, but they again 
um, suggested that the uh, fragment diameter uh, compared to the parent ligament diameter is approximately constant. And this is what we found. It's uh, maybe a, a value a little bit less than the 1.5 shown here. But we do show that if you, over time, if you take a fragment diameter and you compare it to the ligament that, that made it, um, you, get, um, you get approximately a constant value. So what that means is if we know a ligament's width, then we can estimate the, the, the diameters that, of the droplets that it produces. So let's test it. Um, does it work when we compare with Neo et al, right? Because it's supposed to be the same mechanism there. And well, we've got this graph, right? So on the horizontal axis, we've got diameters of, or radii, sorry, of fragments. And on the vertical axis, we've got the probability distribution function. The dashed line, actually, no, the, the, the black data is Neil's data. The dashed line is the gamma distribution that they fit. This vertical dot dashed line is approximately the threshold where we can achieve grid convergence. So what that means is we generally don't trust our numerical data to the left of that vertical line. And we trust, we especially trust the right tail here. This zone here we roughly, we're, we're, we're comfortable with. Um, so basically everything to the right of this line we put more stock in than everything to the left of this line with respect to the purple data. Right? That's the purple data. So if you, if you just look at this graph, it looks like we match quite nicely with the experiment from, from Villermo's group, um, especially in the right tail. Um, and it looks kind of like we, we agree sort of on this portion of the left tail here. Um, but there's a caveat. Um, if you actually look at Neil's analysis, they, they actually they don't have radius or diameter on the, on the horizontal axis. They normalize theirs by a mean. And they estimate their mean using this, uh, this equation here. So they say the mean is equal to some value, some proportionality, uh, proportionality constant chi times h, where h is their film thickness that connects the two cylinders. We don't have a film thickness. But um, uh, through a bit of dimensional analysis, we can approximate it by saying um, our uh, that in our case, their mean diameter would look like this. And when we take their data and we set chi equals 5, that's when we produce the match. However, Neil used chi equals 25. So what does that mean? It, it means that if we just take the raw data and do the raw comparison, there is a horizontal offset to the data. So we don't actually match exactly with their methodology. Um, the shape does match. Um, it is also possible that there is something lost in translation going from the interpretation of their film that connects the cylinders, which again, we don't have, um, uh, and then going to, to our problem here. It is possible that the film that connects their cylinders changes some, character, uh, some characteristic of the, the moment of collision. It could be that theirs is regularized in a way that ours is not, and that could partly uh, contribute to it. We don't know. Um, but um, so it's a sort of a cautiously optimistic comparison with, with, um, with their data. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, something to something to to note with some interest. However, let's let's think more about this left tail here. So we were quite happy with the right tail, at least the shape of the right tail, with in comparison with the gamma distribution. Notice that the order we didn't change the order of the gamma distribution of Neil's results. We 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 kept that the same as theirs, and we we got this nice. Uh, agreement, at least in the shape. Um, and when we vary in our data, we vary the Weber number, and we also vary the cutoff wave number on the perturbation spectrum. Uh, the data on the right here seems to be more or less collapsed. So it looks like the right tail is um, insensitive to Weber, Weber number and, and the cutoff wave number. Uh, this dot dashed line here is a, is a power law. Maybe it's a little cheeky considering that we were just comparing with uh, Neil et al, which uses gamma distribution. Um, but, but it is at least something that we can use to compare the slope of this line. It's about minus 3.5. However, if you look to the left of the peak or the left of where this power law ceases to be uh, true, you see that the, the shape of the data varies. And it varies as a function of Weber number. And although I don't show the data here, it also varies as a function of the cutoff wave number. And um, it appears to asymptote if you make Weber number or cutoff wave number large enough. Um, and it appears to asymptote to an exponent of minus 0 0.5 or minus 1 on 2. Um, so why? Why would that be? Um, why, in fact, for low Weber numbers and low cutoff wave numbers, do we see something that much more closely resembles, perhaps, a gamma distribution? Right? And why does that cease to happen when we go up to higher Weber numbers and higher um, cutoff wave numbers? So 
that's what, what I've noted here on the top left of the slide. Here I've got a little schematic or a little diagram to, to just keep us focused on what's happening with the ligaments. So let's think. We've got these ligaments that are growing and they're emitting droplets. Um, and they're emitting droplets at a certain frequency, right? We can estimate the droplet emission frequency by using another study by Wang and Bree, but they've been very good to us with, their, with um, the, the data that, they, that they've provided. Um, and so they estimate that the, the necking frequency, which we can roughly approximate to the emission frequency, or the emission time, I should say, uh, scales as the, the ligament width to the three on two. Um, the ligament merging frequency, well, we know or we have an estimate for what the drift velocity is. We have an estimate for what the number of ligaments is. We had that on a previous slide. You can, you can suggest that the merging uh, time, I should say merging time, is proportional to one on ligaments, number of ligaments squared. So between two merging events, the number of fragments you expect to generate would be number of ligaments times the ratio of these two times, right? But when you plug all that in, you get one on number of ligaments times ligament width to the minus three on two. Now, the average ligament width, remember we also had a result that said if we know the ligament width, we know the droplet diameter up to a, up to a constant scaling factor, right? So, the diameter or radius, I sort of use it too interchangeably, which is not really great, but the diameter of fragmentation is proportional to the ligament width. Um, and when we actually plot the, the, uh, the diameter of fragments over time, uh, we see that it scales approximately with the square root of time, right? So d frag goes as the square root of time, and n lig goes as the square root of time to the, or the inverse square root of time. This is from a previous slide. You combine the two, that suggests that the number of fragments is going to scale as r to the minus one or two, or diameter two, to the minus one on two. And that is what this exponent is. We get minus one on two on this exponent for large Weber number, and large um, and large cutoff wave number, which seems encouraging. Um, but notice you, you do need those large Weber and, and and cutoff wave numbers to form it. So that's so um, tentative conclusion. Can we reproduce Aaron and Nadal's distributions? This is the the, the gold question, right? Because this is why we're doing this problem in the, in the first place. We want to see if we can get breaking wave shapes or the sh shapes of the statistics from droplets from breaking waves, see if we can reproduce it using this idealized mechanism. We do get a power law, but it's not the right exponent. Because if you look at uh, this data here, the exponent here, it doesn't show it on this particular figure, but the exponent's about minus two. And here it's about minus one or two. Obviously the two are not, not, not the same. Not even close, really, but, but at least they're, uh, they're negative. So why not? Why is that? Is the mechanism wrong? Are we just wrong? Is it not a rim collision problem? Um, is, is it something else? Is there something we've missed? Is the ratio of the diameters between the two cylinders maybe the, the thing that's missing? And maybe it is. Um, but there are some things to note. Firstly, uh, the simulations that I presented to you, remember I mentioned Weber number and Ornazorga number. I did not mention a Bond number or a Froude number. Um, we didn't have gravity. We didn't include gravity because it's a complicated problem as it is. Uh, when you include gravity, uh, uh, you would expect that it would confound, confound the effects. Of course, breaking waves uh, do include gravity. They are gravity waves. Um, and so that, that's the, sort of the main candidate. The other candidate, this is sort of a, a lesser, lesser influence, is that the breaking wave data may include sources of droplets that are not coming from the wall of droplets, right? It could be, could be from the secondary splashing going on. Intuitively, I don't think so. I think the, the wall of droplets probably, um, the, you know, you can take a particular time average of your, of your, um, of your uh, data set and reproduce an exponent which is not, not very distinct from here. The point is this exponent may vary a little bit, but it's not going to vary down to minus one or two. Um, it's sort of, it's going to hover around minus two. It might, might go up to two and a half, might maybe go down to what, a minus 1.5, but, um, but we don't know. But I think gravity is the main, the main uh, candidate. So let's look at gravity then. Um, I should actually check how much time we have. Okay, nearly done. And that's good, because we are nearly done. So let's try and introduce in gravity. We've got Weber number, Ornazorga number. Let's define a bond number, which includes the gravitational constant. Um, and this then helps us to define a capillary length. Um, we're going to keep the perturbation and the cutoff wave number. 
And then how do we connect this with, with breaking waves? I won't go through, through the details here, but by estimating the diameter of the two colliding uh, cylinders in terms of the amplitude of the breaking wave, for example, and the speed of the breaking wave perhaps sets the, uh, the, the velocity of collision, we get a Weber and a Bond number, and you can relate the two to the slope and the Bond number of the breaking wave because the bond number of the breaking wave depends on its, um, on its wavelength. Um, and then I'll show you what the video looks like. The main difference, the really the main qualitative difference, is that the ligaments, the whole process is arrested by gravity. Gravity draws the sheet back down. It, uh, the, the ligaments are no longer as happy to merge on the same time scale. There is clearly a ballistic, it's really almost a ballistic superposition, although it's probably not a linear effect. Uh, but in any case, it, it, it disrupts the process. It means that our time does not grow to be very large by the time we get our final droplet size distribution. Um, although, as it turns out, the rim and the sheet kinematics look, you can do the same analysis, and it's actually quite a simple analysis, and the gravitational effects appear to cancel out to some extent. Um, but more on that, more on that in the future. So let's just look at the statistics um, without, uh, without going through the details of the ligaments and the fragmentation process. And having done this, this uh, comparison of our Weber number and our bond number with respect to the bond number and slope of the breaking waves, and we plot our data. So the, this is all the data from Della Torre, from um, our numerical study in 2022, and from Martin Aronin's data. And if you look at the, the data again to the right of the dot dashed line, because that's approximately where we are happy with, with the convergence, it appears that for these uh, uh, sufficiently large cutoff wave numbers and um, and for the matching Weber and Bond numbers that we tried for this, this, uh, this test, we, we start to see uh, values of the exponent that match a lot better, at least uh, just visually, what we see, what we see in, the, um, in the experiment. So that's very encouraging. But we don't have an argument for it. We don't know why the exponent would look like that. It could be that the exponent, in even, in even the case without gravity, it could be that the exponent is time dependent. And there are some indications that that is the case when we take different time averages of the, of the data. Um, but there's also, there's also another, uh, uh, another, some more things to keep in mind is that the data and the literature are also not collapsed. So there could be bond number effects, so that's what wavelength of the breaking wave effects. It could be slope effects in the breaking waves. Um, they do seem to share the, sh the same shape of the, of the left tail, though. Um, but these are things to, to keep in mind in this comparison. Um, so that's sort of that's where, where we're at at the moment. Um, it's very promising data. It suggests that um, perhaps there is something in, in the uh, identifying this wall of droplets and breaking waves as being produced by the rim collision phenomenon. Um, but it's, uh, we need to quantify and refine um, uh, uh, a lot of the estimates that we have. So, conclusions. So, uh, there is the mechanism for the spray size distribution from, break, from breakers, especially splashing, is unclear. We did some simulations of rim collision. The shape of the distribution uh, approximately agrees in the right tail with, uh, with previous experimental work in the lab. Um, we can produce a power law in the small droplets on the left side of the tail, but the power law exponent doesn't match with what's seen in breaker data unless you include gravity where it seems to then match with the data, um, which is very encouraging. I'm actually very excited about this, uh, about, about that work, um, but there is more work to do. So the future work is why is it a gamma distribution for them but a power law for us? And is it a gamma distribution on the right and a power law on the left? Or is it a power law on both sides of that, of that break in the data? How does the gravity affect the power law exponent? That's sort of the big question. And how can we refine estimates for the drift velocity in, in some of the steps that we just did? Uh, more generally, is this even a relevant question? Are the wall of droplets really a dominant form of splashing in breaking waves? And so that's really that's a question for long crested versus short crested breakers, I think. Do short crested plunging breakers uh, exhibit this wall of droplets? Um, and that's, that's a question for, to, to examine further down the road or as part of an entirely parallel investigation. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my results. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, help comprehend this data. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Uta. I think that's uh, very exciting, I agree. So, are there any uh, questions? Hi, um, 
Oh, well, congratulations for a fantastic talk. Really, really appreciated that. Thank you, uh, It is beautiful work. Uh, more generally, how do you see the, the future of uh, really uh, high performance computing exascale? And would, if you were given an exascale computer, uh, uh, would you be, would you say, oh, finally I can do something? Or do you, would you say, I'm not sure it's uh, really necessary? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think. Um, I think that the, the adaptive mesh refinement uh, uh, scheme of Basilisk is very powerful because it allows us to use much lower effective resolutions that would be net, uh, than would be required in a conventional computer. And so the effects are twofold. Um, firstly, it, it allows us to bring some 3D simulations even down onto the workstation level if you've got enough memory, right? Um, uh, as well as obviously running it on supercomputers. But then on supercomputers, you are limited to some extent um, although this is highly problem dependent, you are limited in some extent to, to, to the scaling that you can do in, in parallel. Um, but in general, of course, you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, arbitrarily increase the number of parallel processes and expect the same scaling. And in fact, you go back, backwards quite quickly. At the resolutions that we're presenting here, and I would say this was even true for the very high resolutions that we had in the breaking wave data, the, the numerical breaking wave data that, um, that we produced with, with um, Stefan and, and Luke. Um, even at those resolutions, the number of cores that we were using for, for where we were having a trade-off between scaling efficiency and runtime uh, was on the order of between 400 and 800 cores which when we talk about exascale computing is, is uh, not, not where we, it's, it's not really in the same, the same sort of ballpark um, in my opinion. So I think, um, but if I had an exascale computer at my disposal, that means that as I increase the effective re uh, numerical resolution of my simulation, let's, do I, let's say I do so arbitrarily and I make my refinement tolerances arbitrarily small so I can get an, uh, an arbitrarily but arbitrarily high resolution, but still efficiently resolved simulation, um, the, the, scale, the, the point at which we get a, um, a break even on the scaling goes up to a larger value of cores. So in principle, yes, I'd love it. I would run a, um, I would probably, and if we had a lot of time, I would, which is perhaps the, the other difficult variable, I would probably, the, you, could, you could do a lot with that, right? You could. Um, well, it's blue sky thinking now, right? You could, uh, is, uh, why not try for a spectral, uh, spectral wave system, DNS, where you're resolving uh, the bubble plumes, for example, and, and a lot of the spray, spray data. Why not try for something like that? You would get an ensemble for, for spray quite, uh, qu quite straightforwardly. Uh, because, at least in terms of the problem construction, because you have so many waves breaking, so you don't need ensembles. You know that sort of. You don't need individual uh, ensembles that you that you have to rerun. Um, so I think that's. I think that is very. That would be very nice. But there's a lot of. There would be a lot of testing, a lot of problem, like iteration on on problem development to go into into that. Um, uh, so with time, it would be. Ult like, ultimately powerful. Uh, but until then, uh, until then, uh, the adaptive mesh refinement uh, scheme and the approach that, that, that we can, where we utilize AMR um, in these two-phase basilisk simulations, allows us to use still fairly high resolutions for limited scale of separation problems, um, uh, which will help us to intuit a lot of the a lot of the results. This is already more than could be done 10, 20 years ago, right? And so, of course, more will always be possible 10 or 20 years from now. Um, but um, yeah, that's my that's my. Okay. Thank you. Maybe this is a little bit external to what you actually very well presented about uh, the contribution of energy balance. Yes, and it might be a bit kind of too far, but uh, I would assume that evaporation also can. Happen. Oh yes, yeah. And then at that very high resolution, you may actually just disperse the bubble. Right? Yes, yeah, that's that's true. There is an evaporative model in in Basilisk. I haven't used it, um, but uh, but yes, it is true that uh, that that is an effect that would uh, show up, especially for the very smallest uh, fragments. 
Um, the dynamics would of, of course change in the presence of wind, which we are not, not including in, in this problem. Um, so uh, yes, it's true that we haven't thought about, about that. I would say that it's not a, my intuition is at least, that it's not a first order effect. Um, or at least not problem. perhaps a dynamically coupled process. It might be locally just conservation of energy or thermodynamic that you would just disappear the bulb, bubble or have just yeah, change perhaps. the mass based on the rate of, let's say, evaporation yeah, or, perhaps, yeah. or yeah. phase change, for example. Yeah, I think we would probably need to do the investigation to, to get a clearer picture on it. Okay, thanks. Everyone. Yeah, it's quite thanks. possible. Okay. So you, you showed, um, I mean, it's in your conclusion, in effect, you showed that um, by studying a specific process, which you identified, you know, the wall of droplet effect, you, uh, you get uh, scalings which uh, seem to match quite yes. well with the distribution if you include gravity. Yes. And um, th that's, uh, that's indeed a bit surprising, right? Because you would think, why would this particular process yes. be so relevant that it actually determines the entire distribution, right? Yes. Um, so that, that's a question. But then the, the other way of seeing it would be um, this particular process is just one of the process representative of a specific scaling, which is universal, which happen, happens. Yes, that's processes. possible. That's quite so possible. So that, yeah. that could be why it's uh, actually a relevant process. Is because oh, where, where do you yeah. think? Do you think you could find this specific? Is that your goal to find a specific process? It, because it seemed like a very well defined event in the breaking process, that's what prompted me to me to look at it. I happened to see Batiste's paper at around the same time as as uh, as we were actually getting the, the, those images numerically. And then Martin came out of nowhere and he was like, hey, you know, we're seeing the same, because he was still at Maryland at that time. And he saw the same sheet of droplets being produced. It just seemed like such a well-defined um, process and it didn't seem to be spurious, right? It, it didn't look like it, it depended either on some numerical parameter or on the particular formula, uh, uh, initial conditions for the wave. Um, so that's what motivated this in particular. Do I think that the specific process accounts for all of the splash uh, droplets, or at least a, a majority of them, during the breaking process? I don't know. I think my working assumption has been that that well-defined process it dominates um, in the in the total if you over the total time average. That's been my assumption. Um, but it is possible that uh, the the subsequent smaller splashes do exhibit some aspect of this, or more abstractly, some aspect of the scaling that give the, that 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 appears on the left left uh, side of that distribution. Um, and I think that that this is a this is a relevant question there as well. Like when we have when we have breakers where really the wall of droplets doesn't show up, do we still see the scaling? And that would be a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I think Chris Blenkinsop at, at the University of Bath may have some insight into that. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other question? No. Okay. If not, or maybe Cesar. Thank you, Udor. It was really interesting. Uh, very amazing work. Regarding what Hadi just said, uh, you can look into Stanley's uh, link paper. Uh, yes. They have a back breakup with evaporation. So oh, yes. You, you might get into that. Sure. And uh, the question I had is, uh, have you considered different uh, distributions of the white noise? Uh, I mean, you, you said white noise. Yes. And you added it, but in which frequencies? And do you know anything about that? Yeah, the, I mean, we, it's, it was a, a white noise spectrum that was then truncated at the maximum, um, at the, the maximum uh, wave number. We followed uh, Paul et al, as I mentioned, um, approach there. Um, it really comes down to, it's not tr truly white noise, right? It's a, it's a square square function in frequency space. Um, it's the, we're uniformly distributed in frequency space, and then the amplitude perturbation in real space is a root mean square value of epsilon zero uh, prior to non-dimensionalization. Um, for further details, I'll might need to come back to you on, on more specific details on the on the spectrum, but that's the that's the, the the sort of the general characteristics of the perturbation spectrum. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you uh, very much again. And so Wouter will be uh, with us this afternoon. He will also come on the cruise tonight on the boat. So if you want to talk with him, you will get two chances this afternoon and on the boat tonight. So thanks again. Yeah, great. Thanks very much.